I admire preachers who week after week <coughs> uh, can give a different topic uh, to the service. And we have high demands on our preachers. And uh, I certainly hope that uh, this morning, as I've uh, spent a week on this service, that uh, maybe that's why uh, there's no second hymn. I wondered why we weren't having a second hymn, because you sang so well for the first hymn. But I want to uh, just uh, introduce the topic uh, this morning because uh, theologically, Seventh-day Adventists are people of prophecy. Uh, the church was founded uh, as a result of the study of uh, two books, Daniel and Revelation. And uh, these books have continued for over 150 years to be foundational uh, to Seventh-day Adventist preaching and Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. And our, ch our church, we believe, as a people, was founded on the fulfilment of prophecy. I was interested to do a, uh, an internet search on Protestantism, and I never realised that in Protestantism there is somewhere between 20 and 30,000 divisions in Protestantism. Can you imagine? 30,000 different uh, Protestant churches. With the Catholic Church, it's not so, but with Protestantism, we have certainly divided and have got varied uh, doctrines. And some of those doctrines are incidental. Some of the doctrines are characteristics of the leaders because they cannot actually get on uh, with the previous leader, so they've hived off and formed another belief. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that we have a particular message to preach. It's not only a message about the commandments of God being restored, but it's also a message of prophecy, of fulfilment of prophecy. And that should not surprise us, because in the past God has raised men and women to preach messages at that particular time for that particular purpose. And we know from the study of God's word uh, that uh, there was no inspiration of prophets from the time of uh, Malachi right through to John the Baptist. Over 300 years, the spirit of God had not reached the heart of men and women that someone should give a special message until this man, John the Baptist, appeared. And he had the gift of prophecy to give a particular message to the particular people at that time. And uh, that message to uh, Seventh-day Adventists and to the Word of God is entitled Present Truth. And I've entitled the sermon this morning, Present Truth for Today. It's interesting because this title, Present Truth, is only mentioned once in Scripture. And you probably think, why bother if something is mentioned only once in Scripture to preach on this topic? But I'd like to read it to you from uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 10 to 12. And if you have your Bible with you, I would love you to open it and follow me as I read this text. In Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read verses... 10 to 12. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Great admonition for you and I, that if we make our calling and election sure, from the word of God, we will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of your Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Peter's writing here to, uh, to the church, asking them 
and reminding them that they know what present truth is and to be established in it. And as I read this in the past week, I thought to myself, we know what present truth was in apostolic time. And Jesus presented present truth to the church of the day and the apostles endowed by the Holy Spirit presented it to the millions of people that Paul could actually say the gospel had gone to all the world in his time. They are on fire with present truth. But we live in uh, 2015. And I ask you this morning, what do you think present truth is for 2015? Because present truth draws our attention to a truth for the current time to tell people. And it's important, I believe, as Seventh-day Adventists that we know what present truth is because there's every wind of doctrine out there. There is constant change in evangelical and Protestant teaching. Constant change. And the constant change seems to be electrifying the minds of people that they're rushing to this church. And over a period of a few years, they leave that church and they rush to this church. But God wants us to be established in present truth. Current truth. There are seven billion people in this world today who are actually dying spiritually for the want of knowledge about God. Have you ever thought about it? Seven billion people. And how are we ever going to reach seven billion people? Because what the world needs in our fluctuating economy in what the, uh, the world seems to be heading into a non-Christian, non-believing lifestyle. And the Word of God draws our attention to the fact that what the world needs is a message of salvation. It needs to, we, people need to know what Jesus has done for them in the past, what Jesus is doing for people now, and what Jesus is prepared to do for people in the future. Unfortunately, the Bible teaches all those three messages because it's called justification, sanctification, and glorification. Theological terms. Where Jesus' death taught people that they are saved from their sins by his blood. We are justified before God as if we'd never sinned. What a wonderful saviour. But when he rose, when he rose from the grave, it assured us that we can live for Jesus. And he will impart to us power to live. It's not by my determination to be a Christian that I live. It's because the Holy Spirit dwells in me and you that we live for him. And both those topics are broadly spoken of and preached about in Christendom. But unfortunately, the third topic of what Jesus will do for us in the future has almost been forgotten because that preaches glorification, what Jesus will do to us when he comes in all his glory. And I believe that what that message is, is present truth for the time in which we live. We need to know that this life is not the beginning and the end. We live 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 years. Then we go down to darkness. Is that life? Is it all over? I believe Seventh-day Adventists have a message of present truth. And so I'd like to share a little with you this morning of what the Bible actually says, present truth. Because people are concerned today. In Luke chapter 21, verse 26, Jesus says that in the latter day, men's hearts will be failing them from fear. The old King James says, 
forfeit. But in Luke 21, in the uh, New English of the King James Version, it says they'll be failing them from fear. And people today are afraid. You and I may be afraid. I don't know. Your heart, you may be fearful in your own life. Fearful from what? I hope you can read that. Because when the, uh, when the uh, word of God was written and when we started to preach in the 19th century, these things were totally unknown. And our forefathers presented these, these topics with great, in great faith. But we see it in reality now. We see these things which are bringing fear upon the hearts of men becoming reality. Pollution of the waterways and the atmosphere. When our forefathers preached about this, it wasn't a reality. But we know now today, we see it on TV. We see Japan, where it's now face mask day because the air is so polluted. We live in an industrialised world and we receive the benefits of it. But it is affecting us in our life. Global warming, the rising of sea levels, the increase of destructive weather patterns. We know it's reality. It's on the TV all the time. There's great arguments, political arguments who don't want to fund the incredible cost to try and rectify what is happening. But it's happening. And they are global warmings and men's hearts are failing them for fear. Most of us change channels. But people in places with knowledge and know what's happening in this world, they are fearful for what's coming into this world. And it says there are global effects of pesticides and drastic possibilities of genetic engineering and medical science. We're incredibly advanced today. Medical science has advanced beyond our expectation. And it would seem almost that in the future, if it keeps going, we can get replacement parts of our organs, pick out which one we want on the shelf. I know that sounds a bit of extreme, but that's where medical science is actually going. The effects of pesticides in this world and genetic engineering I remember several years ago, before I retired from the university, we had a, uh, a young engineering scientist come uh, from uh, Great Britain. And he was an interesting fellow because uh, in Great Britain, he worked in a research laboratory. And uh, he was telling us in the common room one day, he had no idea what he was doing because they're all divided into sector, uh, sections and uh, as an electrical engineer he worked on this sort of component. And then he actually found out over a period of a couple of years that they were experimenting with germ warfare. And they were creating germs where a plane could actually fly over, they could dislodge these germs, for which there were no cure, they only were developing killing germs. And they would dislodge them from the plane and they could actually wipe out a nation, uncontrolled, uncontrolled. He said, when I heard that, he said, I left. He went on to say an interesting thing, whether it's true or not. He said he believes some of these diseases in this world that's, we talk un that are incurable have somehow escaped from these research laboratories. Now, whether it's right or not, I'm not prepared to say. But this particular guy was very well informed. And what we have, we have incidents here which show that the world is becoming out of control and men's hearts are failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And the final one there, where it talks about nuclear fallout. Nuclear fallout and, uh, and nuclear contamination. We know about it because we read about it. And we read about the, the terrible effects on the population in Japan and Chernobyl, where there were meltdowns of, uh, of nuclear power stations. Isn't it wonderful to live in Australia? What a sorrowful thought. Because technology 
is saving people on one hand and killing people on the other. And men's hearts are failing them for fear. My friends, we're living in fearful times. In uh, Revelation chapter 16 and verses 3 and 4, and I'll very quickly uh, go to it because it's interesting because in Revelation chapter 16, uh, John is writing here about some terrible uh, destructions that are going to come upon the world that we know as the seven last plagues. But in verses 13 and 14 of Revelation chapter 16, John writes, And then the sixth angel poured out a bowl on the river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so that the ways of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. And as students of prophecy, we have likened these three unclean spirits to, uh, to uh, Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. And unfortunately, what we witness in the world today is the incredible strengthening of the Catholic movement incredibly strengthening, beyond our understanding. And we need to get on to uh, read some of the, uh, the Time magazine and the Bulletin to just to see the strength of this church. But unfortunately, as Protestants, of which we are, we seem to have lost our protest. And we seem to be just so centred on amalgamation, of compromise, of the purity of Protestantism, that we may become one people and evangelise the world through this one system. But the more frightening than that is that spiritualism, the third unclean spirit here, it seems to be invading the Christian church. And the Christian church seems to be adopting spiritualists and calling them uh, preachers. Do you know, unlike our fathers... Unlike our early fathers of this church, who were dynamic preachers, you only have to, uh, to read some of our, our, our early information about the church, of how dynamic these men were. And if you consider, consider it as a, in chronology, our church is roughly uh, 1844, uh, to now 170, 180 years, going 180 years, and yet we have encompassed the world. We are the leading Protestant missionaries to the world in 180 years. It's a phenomenal growth. And yet, present truth, and present truth is important to us because the message of the kingdom of God is coming. We are, we, our, our foundation was based upon this revelation that Jesus is coming soon. And the great danger of Protestantism that occurred in that huge religious awakening of the 18th, 19th century when they preached that Jesus was coming and they even gave a date to it. It was in November 1844 and he was coming at midnight and he never came. And as a result of that, in the major mainline Protestant churches, they no longer preach Jesus' coming. It, it, it's, it's that topic that's been put on the shelf. We don't talk about that anymore. And yet, it's present truth. Jesus is coming. And the world slumbers on spiritually, but Jesus is coming. And it's called present truth. And some of the greatest preachers the world has ever known preach present truth. Do you know, uh, if we go back and, and look at Noah's preaching, in Hebrews chapter 11 says, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. That's courage. 120 years this man preached that it was going to rain and the world was going to be destroyed. 120 years. And you may think, so what? Well, it never rained up until the time of Moses. Irrigation wasn't from the heavens. It was from another source. And for 120 years, God asked this man to preach a message 
that the world mocked at. And then suddenly, one day, on their own volition, animals began to come. The unclean by twos and the clean by sevens. You can read the story in Genesis. And they came and they paraded into this huge ship, this huge boat. And the birds started to fly of all varieties and settle on the boat. And then suddenly, under the direction of God, Noah commanded the door be shut. But it never rained for seven days. And you can imagine the mockery. Ha, 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 silly old man. And then, suddenly, never before seen in the history of mankind to that date, the heavens broke forth and the waters from the deep shot up and people wanted to board the vessel. My friends, present truth can be preached for many years, but it's present and Jonah, and Jonah in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah preached about the destruction to come. And like you and I, Jonah said, no, no, not me. No, no he said, I'm not going to go up to Nineveh and preach that message. And I don't blame him because up there the punishment was they slayed the enemy. They flayed the enemy. They skinned them alive in Nineveh. They were cruel people. I don't blame him. He got on the, he got on the boat and went to the, uh, Tarsus. And God corrected him. And God's correcting you and I today to get about the message. And finally he decided to go. And he preached that in 40 days Nineveh was going to be destroyed. And surprisingly enough, out of a heathen community, the whole nation repented. The whole nation. And, Jesus, and God spared the nation for another 40 years and not 40 days. My dear friends, we have new theology for this world, new theology for the Christian world. Jesus is coming soon. It's new. I read this statement. I had second thoughts about sharing it with you, but I will share it. In Testimonies, Volume 1, page 446, it says, Nearly all who profess to believe present truth are wholly unfitted to receive the latter rain. That's scary things. That's talking about you and I. Do we believe present truth? Do we believe Jesus is coming? Amen. Absolutely. But have we received the Holy Spirit and changed our lives? And it uses that term, nearly all. And I ask myself, how many are nearly all? Is it 50%? You know, if I said to you today, nearly everyone here this morning are members of this Rockhampton Seventh-day Adventist Church. You'd start looking around to see the few who aren't, because that's what nearly all means. Nearly all means the few. And what it's saying here is, nearly all who profess to believe in the present truth are wholly unfitted to receive the latter rain. My dear friends, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus said these words about this man who was the community reject. You know, there's something about John the Baptist as we read it from the word of God, so magnificent. What a man. Everyone was terrified of this man, even Herod. And uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, there is not risen a man greater than John the Baptist. And in Testimonies, Volume 3, Ellen White writes this, John the Baptist was representative of those who are living in the last days to whom God has trusted sacred truths to present before the people to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. Do you know, my friends, what it's saying is this, that you and I, you and I, simple, ordinary people, are John the Baptist of the present time. It's a solemn, it's a solemn uh, decree, this statement here, 
that goes right down to 2015, though this was written years ago. She said, John the Baptist represented what we should be. And I thought this morning in the few minutes that we have left that we may have a look at this outstanding man, John the Baptist. Because there's something about John that we need to look at. And I want us, there are two, there are two characteristics we want to look at. Number one is character. What sort of character was he? And the second thing was his message. And both are intertwined in our daily lives. It's not what we actually say to people that they observe. It's what we are that they observe. And I think John the Baptist is a tremendous message for you and I today. So what type of man was he? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. Very quickly now, because uh, I promised myself I'm not going over time. Matthew chapter 11. I knew I shouldn't have brought uh, my new Bible this morning because the pages stick together. Matthew chapter 11. What type of man was this man? I'm going to read verse 7 from Matthew chapter 11. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Brothers and sisters, John the Baptist was no flimsy, come along uh, to church Christian. What did you go out to see? A reed floating with the wind? that way and floating with the wind that way. John the Baptist was not a, a weakling either spiritually or physically. He lived in the wilderness. He was a rugged man. He never went into the cities. They all come out to hear him. His message was so powerful. Dressed in camel skin and eating locusts. Not what I would call a wonderful diet. But people were intrigued by this unique character who feared no one but God. And as I read that this week, I thought, does this reflect Cole Friend? Fears no one but God, because that's God's expectation of me, to fear no one but God. I want you to read on. Read verse 8. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments. Indeed, those who wear soft, gar soft clothing are in the king's house. Verse 9. But what did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. How can you be possibly be more than a prophet? Can you imagine last night God speaking to you in vision and audibly? I would be Belshazzar if he did. My knees would shake exceedingly. To hear the voice of God. And John the Baptist heard the voice of God and he was prepared to preach it and to be public about it regardless of the cost. He was more than a prophet because he's, he was characteristic of what God's people should be. Not what they were or what they are, but his... He was characteristic of what they should be. And what should they be? John rebuked everything that was traditional and he stayed only to what was scriptural. He was a mighty man. And if we just... Uh, I'd like you to flick over if you have... We have time. Yes, we have. To Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And I want to read uh, uh, verses uh, 7 and 8 of Luke chapter 3. I've got behind uh, somehow this isn't working. You have to help me up there. Can you flick on to the next one? Yes, Luke chapter 3 verses 7 and 8. You know, when Jesus addressed uh, the clerics of the day... He used incredibly strong terminology. He used it because they knew. 
the way of eternal life. And they failed to preach it. In verse 7, 8, he said to the, to the multitudes that came to be baptised, Broods of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Traditionalism is killing the church. Traditionalism is killing the church. What we need is to be enlightened by present truth. We need to have our roots of belief embedded in the word of God. And what that means is this. Unfortunately, the majority of, uh, of people who love God have problems with memorising scripture. You know, J.N. Andrews, 21 years of age, our first foreign missionary, our first official foreign missionary to Europe, could recite the whole of the New Testament and apologise that he couldn't do the same for the Old Testament, but he said, if you give me the preceding verse, I'll give you the following one. 21 years of age. He was incredibly, he was magnificent in spreading the word of God. And it, it, I feel so humble. And the older I get, I have problems. I have problems remembering the texts. And yet, Jay and Andrews could recite it. Do you know it's the word of God? It's the word of God that gives us spiritual strength. Nothing else. Nothing else. And we, uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, in the final days of earth history need to reflect not only the love of God in our character, but the word of God in what we say. And let me just share very quickly with you. Uh, I'm sure we know historically uh, Huss and Jerome. There was quite a disparity in their ages. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Because what it actually tells me, you're never too old to spread the gospel and you're never too young. And Huss and Jerome had a deep friendship. Both were, uh, were Catholic bishops. And they come to realise from their, 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 their reading of the word of God that Rome had corrupted the doctrine. And so Jerome, so Huss, the elder, went to Rome. And they burnt him at the stake. And Jerome, this young man who was just so much full of vigour and full of enthusiasm for God, went down to, to correct the heresy. And when he went to, to uh, Rome, they took him and they cast him into prison. And they cast him into prison for about 12 months. He became increasingly sick. And he became very weak in mind because of his illness. Because uh, they were not like the jails are today, three meals a day and, and study professionally and come away with qualifications. It wasn't like that at all. In those jails, if you never had relatives, you died of starvation. People brought you food. And Jerome became so uh, deteriorated in health that he recanted. And he apologised for what he was preaching. And the prelates and the bishops wanted to make this a public display. And so they put him back into prison until they got all the, the leaders of the community and the king himself, the emperor himself, present. But while he was cast back into prison, he healed. And he prayed for what he had done. And when they displayed him publicly that he'd make this uh, uh, confession again, rather than confess, he professed the word of God and its power. And they said to him, away, burn him at the stake. Do you know this man sought so much forgiveness when they came to light the fire, he said, don't light it at my feet. Light the fire at my face. And they burnt Jerome from the head down. My friends, that takes incredible faith. And we are living in the last days. 
We are John the Baptist proclaiming the word of God. But do we have that faith? Do we have that faith? My good friends, as I just bring this service to a close, it is purity. It is purity of character and of the message that God has gifted to us. It's not academic and it's not irrational. It is purity. It is the pure word of God that's been preserved through the ages. And as we study it, God will take a life, regardless of how sinful we have been, how sinful we are, and he'll change this impure soul into a pure soul in the eyes of God. And that's what we want to be. We want to be like God. John's message was simply that all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And what we need to speak is something that is true. In Matthew chapter 7 it says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. These were the people that came to Jesus saying that we know the word of God. We are your people. You know the, the story. I don't want to linger on that. And Jesus says to them, you are not. You are the ones that work iniquity. Oh, my friends, may those words never be heard by you and I. For in, the, in the Revelation 22, you know, it's interesting because the word of God starts with the promise of the Messiah and Jesus coming. And it finishes with the same note. Starts with Jesus coming as an infant, as a child, born of woman. But in Revelation chapter 2, chapter 22, he comes all powerful. Revelation 22 and verse 29, it says, Surely I come quickly. And John says in vision, Amen. And even so, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, my friends, do you want to be ready on that day? I certainly do. Do you know, I want to just finish uh, by telling you uh, a story. At a, uh, at a church film night, we don't have the film nights now, uh, unfortunately, but years ago we used to have these film nights when they'd put on a movie. And same as the story I'm going to tell you, all the kids from the neighbourhood came and, uh, and, and often in, in, in these days it was a little bit of a, uh, what should I say, uh, an invitation but it was actually an evangelistic program. They'd show the movie, then the pastor would get up and he'd have a slide program and he would teach the word of God and show the slides. And on uh, this particular occasion, he's really into the, uh, into the slides and telling the, uh, the story of Jesus. When he catches the eye of a deacon who's giving him the signal, and he invites the deacon up the front, and he says, is there a problem? She says, yes, there is a problem. Mary Jones has been lost. One of the kids has been lost. And he was quite taken back by it. And he said, look, has, uh, has anybody seen Mary Jones? Is Mary Jones in the congregation? Silence. Quiet. And so the, uh, uh, the man said, well, we've got the warned the police. We've got the police and her father is out searching for Mary Jones. And uh, anyway, he goes on, finishes his program, the lights turn on, and there in the second seat is Mary Jones. And she was dozing off. And uh, uh, one of the deaconesses come down and says, Why, Mary, they said to uh, ask for you to come because you were lost. And she said, I wasn't lost. I was here all the time. <laughs> My friends, I would like to leave this thought with you. Mary Jones was in church, but she was lost. The great danger for you and I... Uh, is sometimes with our later seeing attitude of having the truth. We have the message, but we could still be lost. And I want to say, I give you the invitation this morning. 
Will you be found in the kingdom of God? May God bless you and keep you till that day he comes in the clouds of glory. And every one of us, family around us, friends with us, will look up and say, Lo, this is our God. He will save us. May God bless us and keep us to this day. Just wanted to remind everyone too tonight, for those of you who've already arranged to go at Yapoon, there is a film night. <laughs> uh, they'll be showing Helen, Mr. Fudge, and having a homemade pizza night at the Yapoon Church starting at six o'clock. Please um, join us in our final hymn. Please stand. We invite you to stand for There'll Be No Dark Valley When Jesus Comes, hymn number 208. loving Father in heaven, we wait that glorious day when you come in the clouds of glory. It's our blessed hope, Lord, when all things will be renewed, when the sick shall leap and the invalid, Lord, shall no longer be invalid. And we ask and pray that each and every one here this morning will not be missing on that day. Give us courage to speak for you and a faith that will never fail. Bless us to this end, we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks,